Hi, I'm Elizabeth Birch. Welcome to Birch & Company. Today on the show, Pat Buchanan. I don't understand what gay people want from me. But I remember being 16 and going, you know, I am totally gay. It's not going to be easy. Get in the way. Get in trouble. Good trouble. The baby bushes have done a lot of damage, if you ask me. Dr. King would have said that we don't have a right to discriminate against any human being. Did you ever say to Ronald Reagan, I, I may this have... disease is going out of control? I sent memos on AIDS. Wake up and start marching on Washington, because if there ever was a time, it's now. You finally said it, that you get special rights if you're straight and married. Are you looking for a revolution? We didn't wait for someone to tell us to do it. We just did it. So, uh, Pat Buchanan, welcome to the show. Thank you. And I'm so honored that you're here. I think I uh, appreciate it so much. Hello. Uh, so often, uh, the people that follow you and, and revere your positions and so on mm -hmm. don't think much of me and think mm -hmm. I'm kind of a negative force. And I can certainly assure you that you know, uh, the people in right. my community... Think uh, I'm a negative force. A negative force. <laughs> and I decided... Which is putting that, it positively. Which is putting it very positively and gently right. so you don't run away. Right. And uh, I don't know about you. I think you sort of had something to do with initiating Crossfire, but mm -hmm. I grew... I've grown very tired of mm -hmm. the one-liners and the yelling back mm -hmm. and forth. And, you know, when I was young, I loved the shows where you could go a little deeper and mm -hmm. get to know the person. And right. so I welcome you, and I'm hoping we can just learn a little bit more about each other, but especially about you today. Sure, delighted. And you started talking a little bit about your grandparents. You grew up here in D.C. Mm -hmm. And where? what did your parents do? Uh, well, my mother came uh, from Shelroy, Pennsylvania when she was 17 out of high school during the Depression mm -hmm. and came down to become a nurse at Providence Hospital, which was then on uh, right up on Capitol Hill. And my father was raised by his mother in Georgetown when his father left him. And uh, he grew up here and went to Gonzaga High School. Mm -hmm. And so they met in the 1930s, and uh, I'm one of nine children out of that marriage, and we grew up in Northwest. We actually started, uh, when I was very young, we grew up in Georgetown, mm -hmm. and that was during the war, and we had a rented house, and we had to leave it because it belonged to a military officer who was stationed at the Pentagon. So we moved out to Northwest Washington, and that's where I grew up. And where does Bay come? Bay is uh, seventh in line, and I am third in line. You're third, so you were her big brother. Yeah, but they were so f we were so far apart. We were her big brother that whether we sort of had we used to call it the two families. Uh, four of us were born during the Depression, uh, and Bay and the bottom four were born after World War II. Gotcha. So there was one that was born during the war. Mm -hmm. And were you drawn to politics from a young age? Were you no, there was no politics in D.C. If you're talking about local politics, we had no mayoral election, no congressional election, right. no school board election. Right. We were literally a colony, and I wasn't drawn to politics, but my father was extraordinarily interested in the affairs of the world, and he read the newspapers and the columnist, and he used to talk to us about them at the dinner table from the time I was four or five. In my new book, I mentioned that I was five years old, and I knew the Lusitania had been carrying contraband when it was sunk, and uh, <laughs> the British had pulled, we had to pull the British chestnuts out of the fire, and it was right. lying propaganda about the, uh, about the Belgian nuns and the children with their hands cut off, and I knew all about the Spanish Civil War. Mm -hmm. So he, but he was tremendously interested in world, in world politics, and uh, in the great struggles between communism and Nazism in World War II. And, right. Four of my mother, mother's younger brothers were all fighting in the European theater of operations. Mm -hmm. So we grew up tremendously interested in, in world affairs. And fortunately, frankly, uh, there was no local politics or state politics, so you weren't bothered with that. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about when you were growing up, um, what formed your views in terms of being a conservative? Because mm -hmm. I think you've grown very weary of the neoconservative. What distinguishes you 
from the so-called neoconservative or the new conservative? What are the main elements? Well, I'm what uh, Bill Gavin wrote a little book. He's a contemporary of mine. He grew up, as I did, parochial school, Catholic high school, Catholic college. And he talked about street corner conservatives. And uh, we learned our values and, and beliefs and loyalties and things like that and attitudes, I think, growing up with your friends in a neighborhood on a street corner in a uh, Catholic youth organization. Uh, and, and those were the values you sort of absorbed. Mm -hmm. In other words, unlike a lot of conservatives who say, you know, I, I read the Federalist Papers and then I suddenly became a conservative. You know, I never read the Federalist Papers, either in high school or college. I never took a political science course. Your views and values came out of your Catholic education, the family you were raised in, the friends you had, and it was sort of an organic thing. It grows up quite naturally. And then you use the, basically, you use the weapons of the mind to defend the things you love and believe in. And so that's how our conservatism came about. Mm -hmm. It wasn't by reading Leo Strauss or someone like that. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you know, it's well known that, that you have positions that cannot be just plotted in today's terms right. on, one, on one part of the political right. continuum. You're against the war in Iraq. Right. And I want to test, do you feel, to the extent you know, that the Bush administration is in Iraq as a crusade? Or do you feel it's for economic reasons? No, I don't mean the idea that it's for um, a war for oil. I don't think so. But there's no doubt. Let's take mm -hmm. the father and the son. Right. Uh, you know, if, uh, if, Iraq, if Iraq did not have oil and Kuwait did not have oil, we would not have gone in. Right. However, I don't think they went in for oil. I do believe President, uh, I think, you know, the first Gulf War. Right was in part about oil. You cannot let Iraq control Kuwait and seven millions of barrels of production every day. Right. So that was strategic, partly oil. But President Bush went in after 9-11. I think the president is authentic when he says, I just am not going to take the chance that this character is going to get some dangerous weapon and use it here. And he, he's a beast, and he ought to go in any event, and I'm going to finish the job my father didn't finish. And so I think he went in for reasons like that. And I do believe the president has been converted to this neocon view that it's neo Wilsonian, that we're going to somehow, we're going to bring democracy to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. We're going to overthrow all these despots and these, these terrible regimes and even the friendly despots. And then when democracy and freedom arise in the Middle East, it's going to be a much better mm -hmm. world. And that will be like Europe. And, and that's my goal, and I'm the Churchill of my day. I think he bought into that. Right. Now, what role, what, what creeps in, do you think, in terms of things like the Book of Revelation? Do you think there's any, any part of the administration that sees Iraq as ancient Babylon? And I think, that it, it must fall before Christ can return? No, the, kind of I don't know that there are... Uh, you know, I don't think Wolfowitz. Is, I don't think Wolfowitz, Wolfowitz would is think that. is not an evangelical Christian, and I don't know any of them that are evangelical Christians and hold to that premillennialism yeah. uh, idea. But clearly, the Christian right, at least the evangelical Christian right, I would right. consider myself a traditionalist Catholic. Right. But they read a, we read a different Bible. We are Douay Rheims people, and they go back into the Schofield Bible, I believe. Right. And they hold to this view that the end times might be coming. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, interestingly, Ronald Reagan uh, was aware of this phenomenon. And he often, you know, wondered if there wasn't something to it. Uh, clearly, he did not base policy on it. But I heard him, you know, say, you know, things are sort of unfolding the way the, this Bible says. That's and he had that sort of attitude about it. But I don't think any of the Bush... People who are policymakers, Rumsfeld, Cheney, Powell, Condi Rice, Wolfowitz, the president, adheres to this view. Uh, the president might be aware of it from some of his supporters, uh, but I think that there's no doubt the Christian conservatives, the evangelical Christian right, the Protestant right, uh, does, a tremendous number of them. For example, when I ran, one of the areas where I had real trouble with them was my view that, uh, you know, I believe you need a Palestinian state and you need a compromise over there and they should have the West Bank and they should have a, 
a capital in Jerusalem and they should have Gaza returned. And this was very unpopular with the evangelical Christians who really agreed with me on right to life. Right, because they uh -huh. they need Israel intact for that's where Christ returns. Well, it, it is that, and, and the unfolding of the prophecy mm -hmm. is uh, Israel has to be reestablished. Mm -hmm. They think that was prophetic, and then comes the Great War. And right. uh, uh, you know, I've been I've seen the plains of Armageddon. Yeah. I've been traveled over there when, <laughs> before the whole area was became so conflicted. But yeah. that's right. Tell me about uh, during the Reagan administration, mm -hmm. you were director of communications, right? Tell me, do you think that uh, when AIDS came about, was it ever put in that way inside of the White House that this is just part of the locus or it's one of the ways in which Revelation is playing out? Oh, Ronald Reagan's White House was an extremely secular place. It was. Oh, yeah. I don't yeah. know that there was. Gary yeah. Bauer worked in there, right. but he came in around. I left in 87 and he came in 87 and he was domestic policy. But th that there was none. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I was aware of the evangelical Christian view on this, mm -hmm. but in terms of his advisors, Don Regan, right. I mean, I was there, and Larry Speaks, and and Poindexter, and McFarlane, mm -hmm. and all of us, uh, it, was, it was non-existent. Now, 1987 was the first time that President Reagan talked about AIDS and HIV. And for those of us that mm -hmm. grew up with it, and I think by mm -hmm. 1987, I'm not sure, but it, it was probably toward 100,000 Americans had AIDS. What were you all thinking inside? Well, what was going on? I was about, mm -hmm. in my early 20s, a brand mm -hmm. new lawyer. We were learning how to write wills, mm -hmm. and our friends had become old men in the way they thought. We all had to think right. about wills and, and mm -hmm. so on. What was going on in that White House that... The president didn't use the bully pulpit to sort of say well, this know, new disease is that's, upon that's us. That's interesting because uh, I had written columns. I wrote the first two nationally syndicated columns, I believe, on AIDS. Mm -hmm. And I can give you the numbers. 600 had died and 1,600 were infected. Right. And I wrote these columns. And that was in the early 1984. 84, 1984. Right. That makes sense. And I, uh, in the columns, I said, look, I mean, we talk about Amer Legionnaire's disease. This is far more fatal right. than Legionnaire's That's disease. And so I wrote it. But at the end of the column, I said, use these phrases, which have been thrown back in my face. I said, the poor homosexuals, they have declared war on human nature. They have declared war on nature and nature is exacting an awful retribution. Yes, I remember that. And, uh, and so there was an explosion there. And the second one, I argued, was, for God's sakes, they had Gay Pride Day. They should shut down the bathhouses in New York before all these kids come up there. Mm -hmm. I said, because, you know, some of them are going to come up there. They're going to get involved in these things. And they're going to go home with a fatal disease. Now, did you know why there was at least the other side of the argument about the bathhouses, which was it became an organizing spot? So that well, I didn't to know the any extent, about organizing. All you knew what's go was going. You assume what's going on in the bathhouses. No, there were people there. If it was a magnet, it right. was the way to get to the young people and educate them. Well, that um, wasn't the argument side that I was on. <laughs> no, I understand that, and I was but in I San Francisco. That, and so I was attacked. But, you know, but I was viciously when, attacked for this. I think this. they probably... Uh, they said, we don't mind they, hearing that, but we don't like to hear it from him. Well, AIDS doesn't discriminate, as you know. So, I mean, you had Africa playing out at that time. And so but, and Africans then, hadn't declared war on but nature, this, but the point in is, your words. But the, but the point here was, it was... Uh, this was, the at that time, this was the principal way by which this disease was being transmitted, and it was an incurable, fatal, horrible right. Right. disease. Yeah. So logically, you say, look, shut the things down. I mean, what are we arguing about here? Shut them down before Gay Pride Day, especially, when you have thousands of people congregate in New York, and people are going to have a couple of drinks, they're going to go to these places, right. and they're going to get killed. So we but, but I think that, just again, what was going on there, Pat, is organizing to educate. In other words, it became the magnet in San Francisco and New York by which people could say, this is going to kill you. Why then did they shut them down? Well, they did eventually. Why didn't they do it then then? Because it, it created a way. It's like saying, um, we want to get to all the Irish. Shut down St. Paddy's Day. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you can get the Irish. They're if all going to congregate. If and there's poison in the beer, you shut down St. Patty's the Day. The point is, is that <laughs> at the yeah. door, right. before mm -hmm. that behavior was engaged in, tons, thousands of young, young men were being right. educated. And that was the gay mm -hmm. side of that argument. Mm -hmm. Don't right. shut them down because it creates a magnet where right, well, anyhow, we can now warn them and educate them because it was sort of still well, this was... mysterious disease. All right, well, let me give you, that was my view. Oh, gotcha. And so I got into the uh, White House and mm -hmm. I, I sent memos on AIDS. You did. I certainly that's did. And they're still, uh, and I have to, I'm going to have to dig them out for my memoirs. No, that's great. Because I was aware, well, I was aware of it. They were, I'll be honest, they were not, there was no awareness. I didn't really? mean, people didn't talk about it. Or if they talked about it, they didn't see it as a, as a national, as a, a, a matter a for crisis. presidential, right. for presidential bully pulpit. Mm -hmm. um, so, and but I, I tell you, I was a reason. One reason I was aware of it was because not only had I written on it, I had talked on it on the radio. I had a radio mm -hmm. show, the Buchanan Braden show, mm -hmm. and so we had dealt with that on radio, and I believe we had dealt with it on TV. I would have to go back and check, because I was on Crossfire Nightly on it. Right. And as I say, I did write on it because I know because I talked to Rupert Murdoch. I remember up there in 1984 or 85 when I was up there mm -hmm. in New York. And he told me that after my columns hit, they'd had hundreds of demonstrators outside the New York Post demanding he fire me or shut down the New York Post. And it was extremely controversial. They were two of the most controversial columns I've ever written. Yeah. And I stand by them because I said, you know, in, in I said, look, I was the first national con columnist to say, hey, we got a health care crisis in this country mm -hmm. and here's what it is. And it's a matter of national attention because I mean, if we're talking about Legionnaire's disease, we ought to talk about this. Absolutely. And McLaughlin did you ever did say it. to uh, did you ever say to Ronald Reagan? I, I may this have. This disease is going out of control. We've I, got these young people dying. You've got to stand up. You know, up. I, I can't quote myself, but yeah. we used to have a Monday meeting with the president every Monday mm -hmm. where his senior staff each would get five minutes to talk about the issues, and I would take issues that were in the news and talk for a couple of minutes just to bring him up to attention, to his attention, issues that in various departments in the White House. Someone would say, you better worry about the agriculture budget, sir, or something's going on in the farm area, and I would tell him things. I can't say for sure. I, I don't have any notes of those uh, meetings, but I, I do have all my memos or copies of all my memos, and so I would have to take a look. But I did well, mention what are, it in the memo. What's your memory? My, I, I don't have a memory there that I did it, but if I sent him yeah. a memo, I probably brought it up in a meeting. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, you talk about Legionnaire's disease, mm -hmm. and that's what we always talked about because it was, mm -hmm. my God, this country mm -hmm. can turn on a dime yeah. for whatever. That was 17 or 18 people. Yeah. But our brothers, primarily our brothers, were all mm -hmm. dying. Let me um, ask you about, again, just mm -hmm. turning back to your childhood and your life. Um, did you ever know gay people? Sure. And... I mean, Were they in your family or your cousins <laughs> or, you know? I'm not going to rat anybody out. <laughs> you don't have to rat anybody out. No, but uh, look, we knew, look, you knew. I mean, you grew up and um, you knew um, certain people were, um, were gay. I had one of the uh, classmates at Gonzaga who, who eventually died, I think, of, uh, of complications. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a wonderful fellow. And I had teachers in college, one of whom was, I remember him right now, got up and he talked about sort of the, he was deeply Catholic and the morality of, uh, he said, there, there's nothing morally wrong with the inclination over which you got no control, and, but people have to be answerable for their behavior, mm -hmm. not their inclination. And he, I thought that was his way of telling me, look, I'm gay, right. but I'm living a good life. Right. And uh, by Catholic standards, and so you all, 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 you mean people, bars, hey, that guy's gay or that's, mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll tell you this, it was very uncommon to know uh, or to have anyone, if you will, come out of the closet sure. or be gay. Very, sure. I mean, it was almost never heard of. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the 1940s and 50s, I mean, I found out later that people that worked, you know, with me and, and, and my, had worked with me and in, in, in when I was an accountant were gay and, uh, and you found out guys who went to school with were gay. And certainly by the time you got to the Nixon White House, and we knew there were people who were gay right in the mm -hmm. Nixon White House and whom you found out later were gay and who were talked about mm -hmm. as gay. 
Uh, yeah, and friends of friends of mine, and uh, sure, a lot of them, and they're wonderful folks. After a lot you, of Nixon, you know, and, right. and the I sure. knew the folks in the uh, and Reagan had lots a, of you know, lots and lots of kids on the Hill working well, for exactly. Republicans today. I mean, so many gay. Well, there's there's yep. many, 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 many more. It seems to me <laughs> they're all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> we came out. <laughs> so but, uh, I, I think there are first. I think there are more. And there's no question that they're uh, they're more visible, more vocal. Do you and think more, there's uh, really more, or is it just that people are just I being think, understanding? I, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Let me ask you this: You know, you've now lived yeah. a little, been yeah. around the block a few sure. times. You've seen a lot in your life. Mm -hmm. Tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, do you? Is your perception that it's hardwired? Even if you think, my God, you should control that inclination, do you think that the species delivers up a certain number of gay people? Though, so, like in the animal By kingdom. nature or nurture? Yeah. 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 I do. That if you saw sort I mean, of a, a not, second not, cousin. Well, let me say, let me say this. Yeah. I think uh, Barney Frank had, uh, had a good line. He, he said, "It's not exactly as if I chose this," you know. Yeah. And I thought, you know, he's exactly right. And let me tell you a story. I had a friend of mine, and you know who he is, but I won't use his name, yeah. who was one of the most brilliant young conservatives I've ever met. He married a friend of mine. He went to Georgetown. Yeah. And I thought he was going to be Speaker of the House. Yeah, exactly. I and he got he... involved. Yeah. And he had four kids, lovely kids. And his wife worked for me, and Nixon's right, worked with me. She ran the news summer. She's a tremendously bright, attractive gal. He had four kids. But I have to say, what in, what is it that impels a guy who's got this kind of fine life to be going around the Tenderloin District looking for teenage kids from the suburbs and to risk an incredible career mm -hmm. and to destroy it all? Now I know I know buddies of mine who have been chased the ladies. But you would and say stuff. that you would say no, that would about say a straight it. colleague too. You but know yeah, that but, if he was running around but if he's chasing running around, a secretary around the well, desk. secretary is different than if he's chasing a fifteen-year-old girl. But I mean, you know, I would say he's got a real, I mean, I would say well, he's right. got a problem. Right. But I mean, I would just say he's right. got a flaw, but he got a problem Absolutely. if he's after kids. Absolutely, teenagers. after kids. So, and so this is what, uh, I mean, I just, yeah. I could not, and uh, he wrote, he, and he wrote a memoir, which I read, and it was very, it was affecting in one sense that mm -hmm. he was talking about how powerful the compulsion was. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I suppose we all got compulsions, but... It wasn't anything like that to destroy everything he had. Right. It was well, incredible. We've, and we've take the that. risk he took. We've seen that in politics. You know, mm -hmm. sex as a compulsion, something, yeah. someone who can't control it. They're almost like an addict. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, don't, I, I think it's not necessarily sort of confined to the gay world. Let me ask you about uh, your speech at the 1992 convention. Here's That's my big speech. curiosity. I know you're very <laughs> proud of it. The radical <laughs> feminists and the abortionists and the gays. Well, but it was, it was or you my, said yeah. homosexuals, I think. Well, but no, let me, good. But, but let me ask you about this. This is probably something you would never reveal, I don't know. Right. But did the Bush senior campaign want you to be the vessel that would hold those views for the convention mm -mm. to appease the right? No, no. No. What the, I talked to the Bush people after the California uh, primary. Right. I did not endorse Bush. Right. But I did say I was going to endorse him at the convention. Right. I said all along, if I lose, I will endorse the president. And so I went in the hospital. I had a heart surgery. At, uh, right after California, and I came out, and I was invited. They called me. I didn't call them. And they put you in prime time. Oh, they called me, but th what they wanted to do is they wanted to have me on Tuesday night uh, after the keynote speech, which Phil Graham was given. And I think Kemp complained uh, that he didn't want me to have that slot. He wanted it. And so they came to me, and they said, this is Kemp Jack. wants it, Jack Kemp. Yes. So I said, okay. And so I, what do you have? And they said, well... You'll speak first on the on first night, right before Ronald Reagan in prime time. So I said, "Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give up the kidding. second night." <laughs> Did they? Have... Yeah, the second night was the keynote. I could not believe it. So I went home and worked on my speech, and they said you have to do three things in it. And I said, "I make a deal. I'm going to endorse the president." He said, "You've got to first, since you're going to introduce Reagan, in effect, you've got to praise the Gipper." I said, no problem with that. Right. Secondly, 
you've got to endorse President Bush, which I did tremendously strongly. And third, you've got to take on Clinton, do the play the attack role. And I said, fine, I'll do that. And so I did all three of those things. And the culture war segment of the speech was a fourth segment of the speech. It was only about five or six paragraphs. And if you read it all now, it's, I mean, it is not, I mean, today it would be very mild, quite frankly. It's sort of Jerry Falwell post 9-11. Remember, he said something very similar. Well, what where, did I say that was was like that? Well, he, he basically that we are in the middle of a cultural war where we are we are observing a time where values and and control is being turned over to the radical feminists, the well, abortionists, say, and and well, what I said was basically rights. this. I said this. What we are, I said, we are in. There's a religious war going on in this country. It is a cultural war. It is a war for the soul of America. And right. this country is deeply divided. There are those who hold, you know, these abortion on demand, gay rights, feminism, these other things are on, these folks are on one side, and we are on the other side. Right. And Jordan, what I said basically, George Bush is on our side. And so what I said was there was a cultural war going on. And frankly, that at that night, if you take a look, and I've got all the polls and things that you can sure. imagine, the night that Reagan and I spoke, George Bush shot up 10 points in the national polls against Clinton. Against uh, Clinton, right. He closed the gap. Uh, by the time the convention was over, according to ABC, he had been 25 behind. He was only two behind. Right. My view was, and I still hold it, was that since the economy was, was sour, and right. only 16% thought Bush did a good job in the economy, you can't talk about that, Foreign policy is off the table. Right. The culture war is the issue on which Clinton can be defeated. And the fact that the Clinton's people came out right during the Republican convention and went bananas over this, even Clinton himself came out, you never do that, during the, told me that this was the battle on which to fight the campaign if Bush wanted to have a chance to win. Right. I still believe that, and I don't retract a single word, and if you go through that, I would defy anyone to take phrases out of it or whole sentences and tell me where that is either wrong or in any way what, or that it ha contains what was ascribed to it. Now, if you step back, do you think the people that were on the other side, that it's primarily a set of Christian values? So let me put it in another mm -hmm. way. Do you feel it was an American revolution or a Christian revolution? that set this country in motion. Oh, you mean go back to the beginning to of the... the founding oh, fathers. We made a jump here. <laughs> I did, because what okay. it ties up to is I that, think that there, the is, there is a way to look at uh, that there are those that hold conservative views mm -hmm. but would see gayness mm -hmm. and homosexuality as kind of inherent and can exist across the political continuum. Well, there's no doubt that there are people who are gay, who are conservative, who are devout Catholics, right. who are Christians, who are Republicans, and, uh, and that is not, I mean, that to me, that's the orientation you're talking about. Right. And I don't think that influence, the orientation did not early on, it seems to me, dictate the politics, because my guess was they were evenly divided. But if you take the movement, the gay movement uh, and the the gay demand for for equality of uh, quote equality of rights and and right to marriage and these things mm -hmm. that is a movement of the of the left that is a movement of the culture war in my judgment. And now there's some uh, you know David Brooks visited my board meeting at the Brooks? human rights campaign. Yeah. The neocon. Yeah, your neocon <laughs> guy. You know he entered being really. Uh, sort of against gays in the military and you know we all explained look we're moving from a two theater right. model to more of a guerrilla model the, the idea of a foxhole is outdated right. and there are units that operate with light artillery they move through urban settings mm. it's a different form of war even if you accept mm. the arguments that were mm. proffered uh, in sort of the 92 93 era and more than that, what could be more conservative than people wanting to uh, serve their country, pay taxes, 
want rights to, mm -hmm. to be incorporated in the, the, the panoply of federal benefits from mm -hmm. Social Security after right. paying taxes and COBRA and ERISA, all that network of rights uh, that are afforded others. And the only way to punch into that machine mm -hmm. is a civil marriage license administered at the state level. I mean, is there any part of you that can decouple the certificate, the civil government issued certificate from the religious ceremony? Oh, <laughs> uh, look, the religious ceremony is up to the particular religion. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, it's, uh, uh, and, and, and certainly in the Catholic Church, you're not going to have that. Uh, but let me, let me talk about Brooks. Brooks is, is for gay marriage, as I understand it. Yes. He was the one who was going to make it mandatory, I think. He well, said, he said uh, we should insist on we should insist the choice on of it. Yeah. Well, uh, well, that's that's a neocon. That may be a neocon position. It's not the neocon position because Midge Dector is very hard on this subject. Mm -hmm. But on the issue of of marriage, on the oh, well, let me take, let's take the issue of the military. I mean, one of the greatest soldiers, the, the, uh, whose biography I have read, Frederick the Great was bisexual certainly when he was young, mm -hmm. and he's the greatest soldier that I've ever heard about, <laughs> mm -hmm. with the exception of Andrew Jackson. Uh, but um, uh, on the issue of marriage, uh, my view is that that, that as a as a uh, as a religious service, it is up to the particular religion. And the Catholic Church, the traditional Catholic Church, is not going to go along with it ever because it's a violation of natural law in their judgment, violation of religious teaching, and violation of biblical truth. Now, the civil ceremony on that situation. I think, well, the reason we give the answer no is we be believe that there is something not only heaven, I mean, God-oriented about the marriage between a man and woman for the preservation of the race, but it is the fundamental building block of human society, and this deserves special protections and special benefits, and we don't believe uh, two homosexuals or two roommates in college mm -hmm are entitled to those I'm benefits. I'm so glad you finally said it. It's so mm. refreshing that you get special rights. Sure. If you're straight and married. Well, if you're, for the it's, marriage, it's for, for the, the couple. Marriage. Yeah, right. sure, there's no doubt about that. Now, why do you think, Me and my roommate just, didn't get them when I was writing editorials <laughs> before I was married. Maybe he didn't think you were that cute, Pat. We don't know. Not as cute as Shelley thinks you are. But when you think about how pervasive homosexuality is. And we also know that some cultures were not based on one man and one woman as a family unit. And we also know that the shamans and the Hawaiians mm. and, you know, different cultures sort of held up homosexuals as a kind of special variation on mm. the culture. And there have been contributions mm. that we're all well aware of over sure. the centuries by homosexuals, by gay mm -hmm. people. Um, why would it be ever present and ever pervasive within cultures if it wasn't also part of the natural order? And why, let me ask you another question. When you mm -hmm. look at the Old Testament, you know, Solomon had a thousand wives, or you look at Leviticus, mm -hmm. and there's a cluster of sins, you know. Sure. You're probably committing one, because that's a beautiful jacket, and it's right. probably some mix of fibers, a little silk. Right. Um, and... What the evangelical Christians would tell you is that mm -hmm. by the time Christ comes, those sins are all expunged and you're into a new world. And as long as you receive Christ as your personal savior, you're mm -hmm. born again into a new world. To evangelical Christians. Right. And it seems to me if this was such a, a, a horrible sin, it would have made the top 10 mm -hmm. of the 10 commandments. And you would have had Jesus talking about it if it was such a threat. But mm -hmm. instead, it's been an ever-pervasive presence in every culture that's been studied. Mm -hmm. Every anthropologist will say, well, there's some variation on it. Well, Isn't it part of the natural order that it would be ever-present? Well, I think maybe there's no question about it. It appears to be part. It, it, it probably differs with various cult Some cultures are, some primitive cultures are very extraordinarily hostile, it seems to me. Uh, I mean, you take the, uh, in, uh, in certain places today, uh, in, the, uh, in the Arab and Islamic sure. world, and of course, Absolutely. that's... Absolutely. It's, uh, it's hard it's, enough being a woman there, in some instances, <laughs> you know. But, but simply because, because something occurs, 
in human nature, therefore it is good, is a non sequitur in my judgment. There is a, I mean, adultery is very common in, uh, in, in all societies, in human societies, and uh, that doesn't make it right. So I think that the orientation might be there. There's a, there's a uh, proclivity, and I can't explain it. I've seen it, I think Moynihan talked about it, among the Irish for alcoholism that is 25 to 1 over the proclivity that you find among Jewish people. Now, I don't know the origins of that, Mm -hmm. Maybe whether it's hereditary or, or genetic by now or whether, I just don't know. But that doesn't make alcoholism right. It's something you ought to resist and fight. So this isn't, you know, in my judgment, we, see, I'm not speaking from the evangelical Christian Old Testament. Right. Uh, I'm a Catholic. And, and we believe that there are certain things taught in natural law, behavior, and, and in religious teaching and doctrine that are right and other behaviors that are wrong. And, uh, and I adhere to that. And I, that's, the, that's the moral code by which you all try to live, much as Catholics know we all fail from time to time. But, you know, we, we know the Bible, uh, you know, slavery was permitted mm. and, and mm. lots of kind of right. pretty sure. horrific things that mm -hmm. were sanctioned by the Bible. And so you're, you're arguing from an evangelical Christian standpoint I'm, uh, you know, and I'm arguing that certainly those things existed, but simply because Christ didn't condemn them specifically saying, look, uh, we got to get rid of slavery here. We got to release all the slaves. I'm not sure what the option would have been when Roman armies captured people to enslaving them. Frankly, right. they probably killed them all. Right. So it's, that's a different situation. But as I've said on one television show, you know, he didn't condemn insider trading either. And we know it was wrong. And the, if you want to take the commandments in the Catholic context, it's the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery, which is interpreted, and the, the church teaches that that means sex outside of marriage is wrong. Now, of all the people that you've known in your life, mm -hmm. including me, a mm -hmm. little bit right. now, um, you can have sort of even something approaching respect and affection, mm -hmm. right, for the gay people that have been in sure. your life. Mm -hmm. But... Is the choice to live life honestly mm -hmm. and openly, mm -hmm. the way I've lived my life, is that a bigger or a worse sin than adultery? In other words, there seems to be this feeling, I don't know if it's among conservatives or just born-again Christians, that this special gonna, temple is kept in the home you mean if you're gonna, about the raging homosexual fire. You mean if you're going to shack up, you should do it openly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to get married. I'm not getting married, though, until I'm legal. And Mitt Romney isn't kicking me out, you know, when I want to get married. Get Gavin Newsom on the phone. You know, I, think, I think that's why David Brooks said that, is right. that he said, you can't, on the one hand, condemn a people and say that they're shacking up or they're, they're being promiscuous or they're living life with uh, you know, joyful abandon, but I, then not allow but these I don't structures. Understand, I don't understand what gay people want from, from me. I mean, what is it? Most of them, as you said earlier, oh, I'll tell you don't, what agree, don't agree yeah. with Mr. Buchanan, and they may not like him a great deal. And... Uh, and so why would someone want my approbation when they believe, or they think, or they must assume that he's speaking from his beliefs, terrible as they are? And I think that what they want is for you to be able to hold those beliefs. And that's a, it's a marketplace of ideas, and they respect that you can hold a religion, and am it I brings act, you to that place. Am I allowed to act on my beliefs? Yes, you are, but, but I think it's not fair to say, but. for example, you once said to me, go convince the people, because you're a big believer in the people. Right. But it is kind of a triumvirate. I mean, there is a role for the courts and the legislatures. No, see, here's my view is this. I think the courts have become a judicial dictatorship, and I think we were founded as a democratic republic. And I'll tell you, no, I would, I would make this bargain. First, I do believe the issue of gay rights is a state's rights issue, number one. Number two, at the state level, it should be decided by
by leg elected legislators and elected executives we can throw out. That's the way the, the founding fathers wanted it. At the national level, by Congress and the president. At the state level, by the legislature and Governor Romney. And third, one state should not have a right to dictate for any other. Now, if you could do that, I think you would, on, on not only gay rights, but on abortion, you would end the culture war. But what about uh, slavery? Slavery was ended by a war in this country. It would have ended anyhow for this reason. It had already been abolished in a number of American states, and it was going to be abolished in the rest. In the Upper South, it was by and large passing out of existence. And in all of the nations of the Western Hemisphere, except for two, it was abolished without violence. And those two were Haiti and the United States of America. And you, so you would have favored letting no it become war. extinct rather than That's a civil Lincoln war favored. over it. That's what Lincoln favored. Lincoln favored not extending it to the territories. If you read his first inaugural, mm -hmm. you know what he said in his first inaugural? I will enforce the fugitive slave law for you guys. I will accept a 13th Amendment to the Constitution that makes slavery permanent where it exists now. That's his first inaugural. He was willing to do that because he believed it would fade out of existence. And he believed that the Union, as he said once very famously to Horace Greeley, preserving the Union was more important than abolishing slavery. But then when he took up the mantle and he had the bully pulpit, the way that, you know, one hopes that when a president uh -huh. uh, takes that, that bully pulpit in hand, that he grows wiser. Much like uh -huh. we wish right. that Ronald Reagan had grown wiser to see an epidemic play out, mm -hmm. or the way we had hoped President Clinton would be wiser to be able to institute some of the policies that, was that a so many wanted. hope on Clinton. <laughs> so <You can't, laughs> I think Lincoln grew wiser in that seat well, and but, saw a different outcome. Lincoln, and he saw Lincoln's see, I, Emancipation Proclamation was designed to uh, bring, uh, prevent uh, European recognition of the Confederacy. And as you know, the Emancipation Proclamation freed only the slaves in the Confederate territories. Right. It didn't free them in Delaware or in Maryland or in the parts of Virginia they controlled or Tennessee they controlled or New Orleans, right. because that wasn't the idea. The idea was it was a war measure mm -hmm. to undermine the Confederates. And that's what the Emancipation Proclamation was all about. But you're happy for the result, but it would, and it would have taken well, much killed, longer. Well, it killed one it, of my great-grandfathers and put the other one in a penitentiary and cost them their place in Mississippi, their plantation. But it delivered up uh, a lot of it would have been people. Better, it would have been better if it had been done without 600,000 dead Americans and a whole part of the country ravaged. It would have been better if it had come about in an evolutionary fashion, even if it had taken longer, if it not it resulted in that horrendous disaster we've ever had, the worst one, which is the Civil War. Now, if here's <clears throat> every time somebody wants something to not happen, mm -hmm. I always feel like they, they say states' rights. Until it comes to something that is very convenient and politically loaded, like mm -hmm. the Defense of Marriage Act, and then suddenly they say, oh, well, we don't need states' rights. Let's just pass this Well, the law Defense the of Marriage level. Act is, uh, uh, well, they did, and the reason you passed the Defense of Marriage Act is because you don't have true states' rights. Uh, it's because, what are we all waiting for? We had 14 states that rejected overwhelmingly, or 13, gay marriage. Why should we be sitting around waiting for Ruth Bader Ginsburg to decide whether it's going to be imposed on the entire country. That well, is an outrage. Well, wait. That's not exactly what happened. That's we're waiting for the Supreme no, Court the anatomy to overrule, of the... overrule the democratic decision of the states. That is what I can't because stand as a judicial dictatorship. the Constitution protects the rights of the individual and the rights of a minority over the whimsical wrath or the intentional wrath of the majority. It's mm -hmm. a triumvirate. That's why we where, have a three... Where, where was the Supreme Court empowered to create new rights? You mean in uh, Roe versus Wade and its progeny? I mean, Is that Roe what you v. Mean? Wade and its progeny. The Ninth and I, Amendment and the penumbra and of I the also, Ninth Amendment. And I also mean over the idea that we have to wait and have them decide whether or not homosexual marriages are going to be 
states will have to recognize them. I don't want the Supreme Court deciding that issue. Let me take an example. In Connecticut, I think they just voted for the first time in a legislature, certain rights for civil unions. Civil unions, yeah. That's not my business in Virginia. That's mm -hmm. their decision. I may not like it. I may talk about it on TV. I've got no right to interfere with that. Mm -hmm. And so this is why I think these things should be... Listen, if these are things were decided by elected legislators, you would have no culture war. The problem is <clears throat> when it comes to pornography, it comes to abortion, it comes to partial birth abortion, it comes to quotas, it comes to busing, it comes to gay rights, mar gay marriage... The courts are ordering these things on us. If they, if folks went at and argued it, let's give me an example. Well, if the say, state legislature in Massachusetts had passed a civil unions bill, which was sort of a de facto marriage bill, and Romney had signed it, we could have said, Massachusetts has gone nuts. But I wouldn't have said the Supreme Court should go up there and overturn what Massachusetts did. Well, then why do you think that full faith and credit exists as a mm -hmm. part of the Constitution? They did not believe that something like this would occur, quite obviously. And you, But they, but it is a matter of comedy, or it's a matter of right. full faith and credit that marriages well, are recognized this? cross do state think, lines all the time? I mean, you do not see in a democratic republic how outrageous it is that Justice Margaret Marshall, one vote on the Massachusetts Supreme Court, can order gay marriages... Uh, validated in Massachusetts, and then Massachusetts, because of her decision, can, through the full faith and credit clause, impose that on an entire nation when 14 states have voted not to have it? Are you looking for a revolution? No, because here's why I find it to be uh, a very deeply American concept and at the very core mm -hmm. of what makes us great. But who decides? Because if it was you mm -hmm. and you were the lone Catholic in America, mm -hmm. you and Bay, mm -hmm. and five-year siblings. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the rest are. Right. And you were a clan, and you weren't hurting anyone, and you loved God, and you loved God in your way. Uh -huh. I would expect a court to step in and protect you. Mm -hmm. Now you'll say, of course, because right. freedom of religion is articulated. All right, well, let me ask you this. Suppose you were this fellow Smith out there in, in Utah. And he said, I have five wives, and we're all very happy. Right. Now, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the United States stepped in. Right. And, and wouldn't said, let no. them have it as a condition of entering. Yeah, but Utah they have, had to drop They it. have it now. They have it now. They've always had it. And the guy went to prison. They've always had it. Listen, <laughs> the guy I, went to prison. I actually think that it's a weak <laughs> argument for our side. I mean, no, I, I think, think that I it's think, a listen, weak. Listen, my view is, well, I mean, my view is right. If you're, uh, Here's my only good argument. You want to hear it? What? That it tends to be a coercive proposition for young women. They tend not to exercise, be able to exercise free will mm. because they're brought into the, the polygamous culture at a fairly young age and have little power to mm -hmm. opt out. Right. And in that way, uh, you know, that's, that's the only, I think, honest intellectual argument. Mm -hmm. uh, on All right, well, look, we disagree on this, but the question that bothers me most is not simply what is decided, but who decides. In my view, you had referenda in 13 states. That ought to rule in those 13 states. All mounted and put in place by the conservative right. Well, who did it? Was it those were not a, gay people. Was it a legitimate vote? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Then shouldn't that be the law, the, the law of the 13th state? I don't states? think so. I don't think so. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, what you're saying is no, we no, no, can't of, win no, democratically. No, wait, wait, wait. Of the 13 states, but there are times, I think, when a constitutional analysis trumps. Where is it? Whether it's a ballot initiative or whether it is a legislature. But what you're saying is... Otherwise, we could have saying, kept the Japanese interned in World well, War II. Well, but as you know, the Supreme Court approved that. They did. But look, but what I'm was... saying is this, is, look, you are saying that despite the fact that these referenda were put on the ballot and elections were conducted and a clear majority said, uh, we don't want gay marriage in this state, and despite the fact it has never been ruled uh, by, from the Supreme Court, that if the Supreme Court gets up one day and decides this is the law of the land, that you got to have it, despite what the people believe, that ought to be the law of the land, 
To me, that's an argument for revolution and overthrowing the Supreme Court. The issue is, in a civilized society, what do you do with this ever-present, ever-constant, small but mighty group of citizens mm -hmm. that they will forever be barred from mm -hmm. what ends up being the ticket to a whole set of rights, benefits that they've helped pay for, paid and bought. I've paid taxes mm -hmm. my whole life. Mm -hmm. Yet I can't take well, advantage of well, a number of the benefits available at the federal level you or can, the state if level. You can if you follow the law. You, that would be like saying you can <laughs> if you'll just become Jewish or a different kind of Christian. No, marriage is an institution and it is between a man and a woman. And that is what the law, that's what's been decided. And special privileges and special rights and special protections are granted for that institution by the majority. How come you, and you never are saying, jumped up and down when you, everyone said, you are saying, those gay people want special rights? Well, How come you didn't say, you're wrong? Well, you know what you want is the special rights for this institution without entering that institution that the majority says has the special rights. I think that what I'm willing to do is intellectually and honestly mm. decouple the religious mm. ritual, which by the way, Everybody churches and synagogues are marrying gay people, some. Right. But let me ask you something else, and then we got to let you go, because you're right. on a big book tour. You sure, got, I'm not a book you tour, got, yeah. You got, it's, you're doing radio. Okay, and by the way, your new book is called Where the Right Went Wrong. Where the Right Went Wrong. All right. That's right. By Pat Buchanan. Right. And how how neoconservatives conservatives question. hijack the Reagan revolution. Right. Right? Last question. When did you see gay marriage bubbling up on the right as a political matter, as a, as, as, as a weapon, if you see it that way, that mm -hmm. could be used. Because gay people were trying to get married in this country from 1972 on. Mm -hmm. But I was aware of research that was done uh, in the mid, early to mid-90s by the Republican National mm -hmm. Committee that had this well up as the last issue. Couldn't win on employment, hate crimes, benefits. Mm -hmm. The American public was there, by and large, on right. extending those rights and suddenly it became about marriage. Did you see it come up as a political strategy or tactic on the right? No, I think what happened was uh, the Margaret Marshall decision in Massachusetts followed by Gavin Newsom. No, but that's so late. It is late. Because 96. It was not, in, well, let me just, Gavin let, let me Newsom answer. was still in high school. Well, let me answer the question. When Margaret Marshall made that decision and uh, Gavin Newsom started handing out marriage licenses and other little jurisdictions started the same thing. That ignited a national firestorm, which is the reason why it was on 13 state ballots and which is the reason why John Kerry lost this election. Margaret Marshall and Gavin Newsom lost the election for the Democratic Party. Now, I don't know if Republicans are looking and I'm sure they're te poll testing everything these days. But this was not a national you, issue. Have you looked this at was the not numbers? A national have issue. you looked at the numbers? They're not. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that gay marriage was determinative. I think it was. I Can think I what tell you my was, theory? Well, let me give you mine first. Right. Is I think this brought out a tremendous number of uh, evangelicals, of evangelicals and conservatives and traditionalists, who said, who might not have said this election's all out of point. Many of us were not that wildly enthusiastic about Bush, but I think a lot of folks came out and said, look, this is. Uh, this is it. It's the society. It's at stake. This time we got to be counted. Mm -hmm. And I think the evangelical Christians and all the others, and to the degree that these are issues that are on television and people are watching it, mm -hmm. I think the emotion of it, and when you consider Bush won a turnaround of 60,000 votes in Ohio and Kerry's president, I think Gavin Newsom and Margaret Marshall are the Republican Party's principal assets in 2004. Let me tell you what I think really happened, because if you look at the margin between the 13 mm -hmm. states that had ballot initiatives and those that it's didn't... 58 to 85. Point two. Point two. It's, it's 2.9 to 2.7 margin in those two states. I'll tell you where the big gap is. Mm -hmm. Women. And I think what happened is that women, mothers like me... Mm -hmm. Watch the Swift Boat episode play out. Ineffective response by the Kerry campaign, granted. Right. And then the Russian school Best line. got invaded by the Chechnyans, and they watched children being treated instantaneously in the most cruel terms. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a build-up to a holocaust. It was a holocaust overnight. 
And I think women said, if they're not going to respond to an inaccurate charge about mm. swift boats, mm -hmm. are they going to go get my kid out of a school? If you look at the margin on women, it's mm. huge mm -hmm. compared. Now, I haven't gone deeper to figure out how many of those were evangelical women, but the margin on gay marriage, do you know that out of 20 major issues, it was 20th mm. in, the, in the exit polls? I just don't, I think that you're right, it was used as but a you driver. Did see, you did see the, um, the famous exit polls that came out afterwards was, I think, moral values. They did, but that was so inartfully 23, Yeah, but even drawn. if it's inartfully, you're talking about 23% of the people. But you've got to figure out what it means. one for Bush. Who knows what that means? We don't know. It was so badly written, that exit poll. So you have to go much deeper and drill down but and figure out what's going on. I think you can tell by the reaction of the Democrats who are... <laughs> Yes, I think they're Moving all. Moving crab eyes to the center. I'm, believe me, I am. I am they wondering. They think I'm right. <laughs> I think. I think you may have a point there. Yeah. Pat Buchanan, thank you for coming. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure I know enough. that your love of gay people has only deepened during this session, <laughs> and that you're going to get out there and fight for our rights. So right. thank you for coming. I take I it easy. It. We'll see you. All, all right. right. Okay. A couple of things to notice here: not all conservatives are created alike. Pat Buchanan is a traditional Catholic conservative who holds fast, some would say like a dog to a bone, to traditional values and what he determines and defines as a traditional value. He is quite a species apart from the born-again evangelical Christian conservative, a Protestant conservative, or the so-called new conservative, a whole group of neoconservatives that he has a lot of contempt for. Pat Buchanan is the kind of man that we will probably never in our lifetimes win over. But there is a couple of things to notice. First, he all but acknowledged he has known gay people and thinks there's something basically inherent about being gay. He was not able to answer the question of why don't we honor the constitutional process in our country as much as the legislative or, or electoral process. He is a man who believes that if you turn everything over to the people, the people will always make the right decisions. We know from American history that that's not true. We were born out of a kernel of slavery that we have let yet to expunge from our souls. It's our original national scar on our hearts. But we have committed many other sins as well, and we have long less left behind the notion that women and children are property, or the internment of the Japanese, or exposing immigrants and children to working conditions on the Lower East Side at the turn of the century. The fact is that American is a human experiment, and during our time, this time, the gay civil rights years, we are literally the light on this nation to show how we can get better and better as history plays out. I don't think we'll ever have Pat Buchanan with us, but I think I saw a softer heart than we knew during the AIDS epidemic. I only wish he had screamed from the roof of the White House to say, our children are dying. Mr. President, do something. Thank you for joining us on here. We'll see you next time.